Hey, welcome to the show. Today we're gonna to talk about model number four in a series of six different models where we are looking to determine and establish the fair market value of XRP. Today we're gonna to go through the Athne and Michnik model. Hey, Molly here. Today we're talking about the Athne Michnik model uh, as part of our ongoing project to determine the fair market value of XRP. So if you've been patiently following along in this series, thank you very much. If this topic for some reason upsets you, you do not need to watch this video. Uh, I am going to be explaining a little bit about a model that was created back in 2018 by two people, Susan Athne and Robert Michnik. Uh, and it was pretty groundbreaking in that you know, XRP is an asset that, and they actually included Bitcoin in their model as well, but these digital assets are unlike other forms of money or stocks or other real estate that traditionally gets valued by, you know, communities like accountants and investment banking. And one of the real kind of genius parts about this model that is very important in understanding, in my opinion, the value of an asset like XRP is this competition between two competing forces. So XRP is a utility asset, meaning it can be used to exchange value very quickly, very efficiently, and it also can be used to store value. And as we've gone through and built all of these models, this is like the biggest theme or assumption or debatable point. And the Athne Michnik model does an incredible job of addressing this in their paper and in the model that they built. So I just want to talk about this for a second. So uh, we've been kind of building these models. I've been making videos and threads about them. I've not built any of the models, actually. I'm just sort of acting as the translator of the model building team to anybody who's interested in learning about what we're doing. Uh, and I kind of got behind. So initially, I was sort of, we were creating a model or finishing one, and I would sort of post and share about it and do the video after. And so I was sort of like learning as we go. And actually all the models are now built and I have the benefit of being able to talk about the fourth one in the series, kind of knowing what the big picture lessons that we have learned are, which are pretty cool. And the Athne Michnik model is very important in this series because it does a very simple and clear job of separating these two fundamental forces, the force of utility, the force of store of value. Um, and if you watch my video about the virtuous cycle, which I did a while ago, I'll put the link in the description. This is a kind of a, an electronic or energetic force that can compete in markets. And if you imagine like a cyclone where it kind of starts out sort of small and as it gets more powerful, it kind of widens and accelerates and all of the elements in this cyclone start to move faster and faster. Uh, it's kind of the opposite of what would be considered a death spiral. This is more of a positive growth oriented thing called the virtuous cycle. And in the case of the Achne Michnik model, uh, what they are, what they created a sort of calculation for is as more value gets transacted on the XRP ledger using XRP, it's going to naturally rise in price simply because there will be higher demand, more use, it probably won't be an actually i don't think it would be a very large increase in magnitude but it would be enough that it would get the attention of people and in this era we have of fiat inflation where there's a lot of skepticism if i were to hold my wealth in let's say us dollars would i have the same amount of value in a thousand dollars today in like five years and the answer is probably no. We're seeing inflation has really eroded, uh, eroded the value of the dollar. So there's kind of a concern. Like if I have money, wealth that I want to store, where should I store it? I have to store it someplace. And if you were to observe the value of XRP steadily rising because adoption is growing and people are seeing this as more and more of a valued utility asset, then what happens is people say, hmm, got to store my wealth somewhere. Why not store it in some XRP. And what this can do is remove XRP from the circulating supply that is available for transactions. And all these sort of forces of supply and demand come into play. So if something is in demand, price goes up, and now we have another competing force that's going to pull out some of the supply, 
meaning these calculations of supply and demand, you have increased demand while diminishing supply. Now the price goes up some more and it creates this cycle that potentially could lead to exponential growth at some point. Now, the interesting thing we have observed, observed in some of these models, and if you've ever studied anything like the compound effect from sort of savings, it often looks like not a whole lot is happening for a while. And then it kind of all clicks into place and that's when the exponential growth uh, takes over. And this I think is very similar. And one thing we've done in some of these models for this paper that we're working on is create some scenarios because the most difficult part, in my opinion, for the, any of these models are some of the assumptions that go into it. How much, how much value will be transacted on a daily basis? We don't really know that we're trying to estimate that. How much value globally would be stored in XRP or stored on the ledger, which another debatable point is whether or not value stored on the XRP ledger is functionally a derivative of XRP. This is another topic that we debate pretty openly, and uh, I think there's two different schools of thought around that. Uh, but fundamentally, the value of XRP as an asset is going to come down to two separate components, the transaction value, which actually we've seen when we have some models that just look at that element alone, the value increase is not very high in the next like 10 years. Over the course of a very long period of time, it would impact it as tons of value gets moved in exchange. But the real driver of price for this asset in the next 10 years would be use of XRP as store of value. And someone actually commented on my Twitter that, you know, if that's the biggest price driver, does that sort of take away the beauty or value of what XRP is about? You know, if the, if the, store of value is most significant, how is it really any different than another asset that doesn't have the incredibly fast, efficient transaction processing that XRP has? I, and I did spend some time thinking about this because it's a great point. And I think that it's really because you're getting this two for one deal with XRP. You're getting this incredibly efficient, well-run kind of tool that is allows any value to be moved very quickly and efficiently across, you know, it's sort of an interoperable world where you can, you can move from assets to currencies to whatever. But so because of that, it makes the second component more desirable. So I think that when you look at only one of these things, you're kind of missing the beauty of what this asset is capable of. The truth is though, that store a value, like most of the money in the world isn't going to be transacted on a daily basis, right? If I have tons of real estate and I own tons of stocks and I own tons of gold, I'm likely, even if I'm a country and this is like my sovereign wealth, it's not really necessary for me to be transacting that on a daily basis. Now, separately in the global trade world and the foreign exchange markets, you know, in all this sort of world of commerce where money is exchanged on a daily basis, uh, relatively speaking, you're never going to have more money transacted than you have sort of wealth that's being stored because you just you don't need to exchange all the wealth but you need to exchange a small amount for global trade and commerce and that stuff so i think it makes sense that if you have this two for one package deal like an xrp then you would see that the larger component is going to have a bigger driver on price it's kind of like if you've ever done any weighted averages it's sort of like a weighted average and the weight is based on the the volume of the value and this uh, Athne Michnik model, when we ran all these different scenarios, you can put in these two different, you put a bunch of variables in, but two fundamental ones is sort of the store value component and the transaction value component. And you can play around with it and put whatever you want in. The challenge, as I said, is coming up with what assumptions do you think are plausible? It's not that simple to be totally honest. We can look at what the transaction volume is now, but one of the realities is when we move to blockchain-based payments, Javon's paradox is going to kick in and all these new business businesses that are not financially feasible or practical right now will likely emerge. I mean, we saw that with the internet, right? If you go back 20 years, there weren't a whole lot of internet businesses. So we had some traditional companies that moved their operations online. But then once the internet became a mainstream sort of utility for everyone, all of these new businesses emerged because you had this mechanism to communicate very quickly, very inexpensively that just didn't exist before. 
And the same thing will likely happen when we move to these blockchain payments. We will see a lots of new things. So the growth will not only be vertical, sort of horizontal, but it will be vertical as well, if that makes any sense. So as a result, it's difficult to predict, you know, in 10 years after we've migrated to a new system, like how many new businesses will start? Like, I, I don't know. It's hard to say because in the same way, it would have been hard to predict all of the businesses that would arise over the internet. Uh, and so it's been kind of an interesting exercise to play around with these assumptions and see when you test different scenarios, what is the impact on the price? And there's a tool that I'm going to put in the description that you can play around with it for yourself and see. And one thing that surprised me initially was this variable of transaction speed. So if you're looking at the utility side where money can be exchanged from one thing to another very, very quickly and efficiently, one of the beautiful things about XRP is that the same XRP could be used like over and over and over and over. The transaction speed is very fast. And what we found though, is that while that's awesome, it's not a huge driver of price. And that when we plugged in doing a transaction a second versus a transaction an hour versus a transaction a day, there was some change in price, but it wasn't a big magnitude. So while that is an incredible feature for efficiency and it will make the XRP ecosystem very desirable because money loves efficient systems, the interesting thing in terms of the price of XRP is it's really more about the store of value on the blockchain, the store of value within XRP. And I know there is this separate thing about whether or not tokenized assets on the XRP ledger are functionally derivative of XRP. Great, interesting debate. I know that some of my developer friends have strong opinions on that, but when I've talked to some other people who actually work in the XRP space, that opinion is not, there is not consensus on that. So I think that's a fun thing to debate as we still kind of look forward. And what that other side of that debate is, is really looking forward to a possible scenario where XRP is the world reserve currency. And when that happens, if that were to happen, sorry, then what all of these separate currencies that people have right now become an extra unnecessary step. So for example, let's say I have a bunch of tokenized gold and I want to exchange it to somebody else who has you know, Canadian dollars. Let's use the ODL example where I would take my gold. It would There would be a two-step transaction where first I would sell my gold for XRP and then I, my XRP would be used to buy the Canadian dollars. This eliminates the need to have a trading pair between every combination of all the things. It's why this sort of XRP as the neutral bridge asset is so valuable because if you've ever studied anything about liquidity pools, if you had the liquidity pool for every single combination, it would be um, a lot, <laughs> a necessary lot. So having everything just go through XRP is simple. Now, let's say, though, I was using my gold as like a payment for something. Like, let's say I, you know, hired somebody to do some consulting and I have to pay them and I'm just going to pay them in tokenized gold and they live in Canada, so they want Canadian dollars to buy stuff. In that case, it's really just value from one person going to value to another person. And in this first scenario, we're going through three layers of value. First, I'm taking the tokenized gold, then I'm converting it to XRP, and then I'm converting it to Canadian dollars. Now, imagine though, we're now two different countries who are exchanging value like on a daily basis, like they're trade partners. And you, know, you have one country that's selling gold in one country that's selling, well, let's even say they're paying for like some kind of service, right? And they're paying through these tokenized assets. Or I guess it would apply if you were still, if like if I was buying a bunch of corn from you and I wanted to pay you in tokenized gold, but you wanted to receive the money in your native currency, I guess that totally works. Still same thing. We've got to go from asset A into XRP into asset B. And it is very fast and efficient to do that on the XRP ledger, but eventually there might be a point where it becomes unnecessary. If I'm a country and I'm trading with another country on a daily basis, and I'm like, I'm not going to necessarily spend that money that I'm getting paid in, I'm going to save it so that I can turn around and buy something else from someone else tomorrow. There will become a point where it's like, you know what, why don't we just do this all in XRP? Because 
trading to all these other currency pairs is just like an unnecessary step. And that's the idea that eventually all of this value that is being on the XRP would just become that priced in XRP and stored in XRP. And so the value would sort of shift in terms of what it's represented by. Now, I know in terms of like technology tokenization, this is a little bit difficult to grasp because I don't think this is going to happen quickly. It will be like a, an evolutionary type thing where it just becomes easier at some point to stop exchanging it back. And then if you were to look at this from a macro level across an era, you could see this shift. And this is why some of these models that we're looking at are very forward thinking and saying, let's assume we've gotten to that point. What does the value of XRP need to be to cover all of the value? So that's the argument with this idea that everything that would be minted or tokenized on the XRP ledger would fundamentally and eventually become a derivative of XRP in terms of its value. That's sort of the idea that eventually there would be this shift due to an efficiency measure. So and that's that. The a and model, uh, incredible way to look at the power of these two variables, part of the virtuous cycle, the store of value component and the utility component. Play around with it, see what you like. You can Google like what are daily transaction volumes for the FX markets or the um, you know, daily global trade. And that's sort of where it becomes debatable, like how much money would be traded once this sort of gains some kind of adoption, we obviously know uh, XRP is going to be used for cross-border payments, but there's many, many other sort of markets out there that exchange value on a daily basis. And so for our paper, we are have actually going to have a couple different scenarios that we're looking at. I did share one scenario in the white paper, or sorry, in the Twitter thread, which I'll also put the link in the description. And it's interesting to debate some of these assumptions. And one thing I find not helpful though, is when people tell me any of these assumptions are impossible, when I don't really think we really know what's possible and impossible. Part of the work that we're looking at with the valuation committee is sort of future value that isn't, isn't necessarily um, available at this point. So let's say you found some gold underground and you had the technology to, to tell that it was under there do we need to account for that now knowing it will be mined in the next couple of years? And then you get into some even more uh, fascinating topics, which is this asteroid mining idea, which NASA has shared uh, information on. And there are asteroids out there that contain some incredibly high value precious metals that will be mined in the next you know, decade or so if we plan on having a financial system that is stable for quite a long period of time. Do we need to account for that value? potentially. So this project has raised some really interesting questions about kind of where are we going? What it What is all the money is probably one of my favorite topics. It seems like a simple question to answer, but the more we have dug into this, the more people have sent us things, uncovered things. There's like a treasury document we have about from the Philippines, which is absolutely fascinating. Probably do a whole separate video on that one because that is quite an interesting rabbit hole. But the numbers in that document from the... Um, Philippine money thing, which I'll just call it that for now. The numbers are so big, I don't know the English words for them. Like there's so many zeros, it's like beyond what I have even ever said out loud in terms of a number. And so if you really were to think about all the money in the world and this scenario of let's say down the road, an asset like XRP is the world reserve currency and functionally replaces the dollar, how much would it need to be if it hypothetically had to cover all of the value in the world? First, you got to know what all the money is, all the value in the world. And that has turned out to be a very difficult yet interesting question to answer. It's gonna, This makes that $14.3 quadrillion lien look like jump change compared to some of this other stuff regarding the total global supply of gold, including the gold that we don't, uh, you know, as average citizens are not privy to know about. So, all right, I'll be back soon with model number four of this. Actually, this is four. I'll be back with model number five and we will wrap up all of them, hopefully in the next week or so, I'll put the links to the description of the other one, the previous models, and then we'll be following up with a very comprehensive paper um, as soon as it's done. All right. Thanks. See you in the next video.